Welcome to PBC Online. My name is Andy Cook. I'm part of the staff here at Panama Baptist Church. I'm so glad we're able to connect in this way. Got a reminder for those who are invested in Panama Baptist Church. We're going to be having a building project update. That's January 15th at 9.45 a.m. here at the building. We'll be doing a video version to follow later that same week in both versions, the, the in-person one and the video version. We're going to share some renderings of the exterior. We're going to describe the three options that are in front of us. We'll have a time for Q&A, and then I will explain the input form that we're going to use to try to get your input. We value your insight. And we want the wisdom of God as we consider the options that are in front of us. We strongly desire to have a building that supports our mission well. So please plan to attend and prayerfully give us your input. That would be awesome. At the in-person service this week, we're going to be recognizing our prayer ministry volunteers. Praying is one of the most strategic things we do here at Panama Baptist Church. So we're going to recognize those who volunteer in that ministry. we got kind of two different uh, ministries, the prayer ministries. One is the weekly prayer updates. It takes a small team to gather those prayer requests, keep them updated, get them pushed out to you on Tuesdays. And then, of course, there's the army of volunteers who pray for the things that are in the weekly prayer email. The second prayer ministry that we have here is Carrier Battle Group. This group gathers to pray for the urgent stuff, right? The health needs, the jobs that we're trying to get, the, the situations that are going on in our homes and with our friends, right? The stuff and the people that we're concerned about. But they also pray for the important things, the things that are going to matter in, in eternity. So I want to talk about them a little bit and uh, how you can take advantage of this group of prayer warriors. If there is someone that you are trying to rescue or someone that you're trying to disciple, I encourage you, let us know, and we will pray for that person. We'll pray for you. We'll pray that God gives you the four opens, right? We'll pray that God, the open doors, natural opportunities to be in dialogue with that person. That group will be praying that God will give that person that you're hoping to rescue or disciple an open heart that is willing to seriously consider truth. They'll be praying that God gives you open ears and open eyes to be able to see what's taking place, what's really going on, what, what's being communicated non-verbally, what's happening beneath the surface. And then, of course, they'll be praying that God gives you an open mouth at just the right time so you can say something or ask a question that will help this individual take the next step in their faith journey. If you're going on a missions trip, Man, let us know. This group, Carrier Battle Group, will pray for you, and they will pray for those that you are trying to help. If you're making a major decision, let us know. Carrier Battle Group will pray for you, that God will give you the wisdom you need, and the leading you need to make a wise, God-honoring decision that you'll never regret. Uh, and I'll also let you know, Carrier Battle Group, prays for categories of people. Recently, we've been praying for coaches, that God would give them favor with those that they coach. We've been praying for those who work with customers, that they would be able to put love on their customers. We frequently pray for our teachers and others who work in our public schools. We frequently pray for parents. We pray for missionaries. We pray for groups of uh, other groups who are trying to live out their faith, and we would love to pray for you. Speaking of prayer, let's pray now. Father God, I pray that these minutes that we have together will be helpful to us. God, help us to think your thoughts, to understand your ways, to, to ponder just what an incredibly great God you are and, and your plan for this world, your priorities for our lives. God, I pray that you, this time will be helpful to us. I pray, secondly, God, that this time that we have together will be honoring to you. God, deliver us from thinking small thoughts about you because you are no small God. You are far greater, far bigger, far more worthy than anything that we could ever imagine. And so, God, I pray that as we spend time together, we would honor you. I love you, Praise Lord. in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's join Will with the praise band as they lead us in song. Me. All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been 
And on that day, we join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith with one voice a thousand generations sing worthy is the lamb who was slain and on that day we join the resurrection and stand Are you a New Year's resolution kind of person? We're recording this for the weekend of January 8th, kicking off 2023. New Year's resolutions come up a lot uh, this time of year. Some folks don't bother with resolutions. Maybe that's you. Other folks make resolutions and they're successful in them. But it seems like the majority of people make resolutions and then somewhere throughout the calendar year, uh, it falls apart and then the next year rolls around and they make that resolution again. Which one are you? Are you a New Year's resolution type person? If if you spend time in the church, if you're around church, and maybe this was your resolution this year or it's been in the past, one resolution that you often hear is people say, I'm going to read my Bible more. Uh, I, I'm going to be consistent in my Bible reading. Or maybe you've even made the resolution of someone that says, I'm going to read my Bible through in a year. Uh, cover to cover, start to finish in one year. Have you ever tried to do that? Uh, and so you sit down with the best of intentions for this resolution and you open it up to the beginning of your Bible. We've got Genesis. Oh, and, and Genesis, you're reading, you, you read about creation, how the world was formed. Adam and Eve are introduced and we see the way that God intended the world to be. But then we're introduced to the serpent and we see where sin entered the world and we became a, a fallen human race because of this sin. And, and then we're introduced to Cain and Abel and, and the world's first recorded murder is right there in the book of Genesis. And then suddenly when things couldn't get any worse, here comes Noah and, and we're, we read about this story of the worldwide flood and how Noah built this ark. And then we're introduced to the characters of Abraham and Sarah and then we read about Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. And Joseph's story was a page turner. We just did a series about that last year. And you're cruising through the book of Genesis. You're like, wow, there's all these stories. This is great. I'm going to keep going. So now we get to the book of Exodus. And Exodus is just more of the same, more amazing stories of God fulfilling his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and how the Israelites were enslaved in a foreign country. And God dramatically delivers them to freedom out of the land of Egypt. And we're going through the book of Exodus and like, wow, this is amazing. Look at everything that God did. We read about the 10 plagues in the book of Exodus and how God used those to, to free the nation of Israel out of their captivity. And we're introduced to the Passover. 
And then this is where we read the story, too, of uh, Israel is leaving and, and they're being chased by the land that was holding them captive. And they come up on the Red Sea and there's this army coming from behind them, this giant sea in front of them. And there's no escape, but God miraculously splits the Red Sea and they're able to cross over on dry land. That's the book of Exodus. And we're reading that. And then we flip the pages again. And, and then we read where Moses got the Ten Commandments from God. Whew. There is a lot in those two books, Genesis and Exodus, and we're reading through like, man, this resolution is great. I am just cruising, turning one page after the other, reading all of these different stories, and things are really moving along. But then suddenly, you turn past Exodus, and you hit Leviticus. <laughs> Have you ever tried to read through Leviticus? I think this is maybe where a lot of those resolutions fail, is in the book of Leviticus. Let me show you what I mean. Let me just start reading in Leviticus. I'm going to start in chapter 1, verse 2. Here's what it says. Speak to the Israelites and tell them, When any of you bring, brings an offering to the Lord from the livestock, you may bring your offering from the herd or the flock. If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he is to bring an unblemished male. He will bring it to the entrance to the tent of meeting so that he may be accepted by the Lord. He is to lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering so that it can be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. He is to slaughter the bull before the Lord. Aaron's sons, the priests, are to present the blood and splatter and splatter it on all sides of the altar that is at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Then he is to skin the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron, the priest, will prepare a fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire. Aaron's sons, the priests, are to arrange the pieces, the, the head and the fat on top of the burning wood of, on the altar. The offerer is to wash its entrails and legs with water. Then the priest will burn all of it on the altar as a burnt offering, a food offering, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. <sighs> what? <laughs> Were you, were you as lost as I am when you're reading those verses? And chapter after chapter has instructions like this. This is God giving instructions to the Israelites. But it, it's kind of a slog to read through. It's kind of tedious to read through the book of Leviticus. And you think, okay, well, uh, I'm going to skip forward a few chapters. Surely it's not all like this. So you jump forward, uh, let's just say chapter 13. Well, here's what it says in Leviticus chapter 13, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. When a person has a swelling, a scab, or spot on the skin of his body, and it may be a serious disease on the skin of his body, he is to be brought to the priest, Aaron, or to one of his sons, the priest. The priest will examine the sore on the skin of his body. If the hair in the sore has turned white, and the sore appears to be deeper than the skin of his body, it is in fact a serious skin disease. After the priest examines him, he must pronounce him unclean. But if the spot on the skin of his body is white and does not appear to be deeper than the skin, and the hair in it has not turned white, the priest will quarantine the stricken person for seven days. The priest will then re-examine him on the seventh day. If he sees that the sore remains unchanged and has not spread on the skin, the priest will quarantine him for another seven days. The priest will examine him again on the seventh day. If the sore has faded and has not spread on the skin, the priest is to pronounce him clean. It is a scab. The person is to wash his clothes and will become clean. But if the scab spreads further on his skin after he has presented himself to the priest for his cleansing, he is to present himself again to the priest. The priest will examine him, and if the scab has spread on the skin, then the priest must pronounce him unclean. He has a serious skin disease. Doesn't seem to get a lot better uh, the further we go into Leviticus, is it? I mean, all of these instructions for the sacrifices and offerings and, uh, and trying to determine what kind of disease somebody has. It would be really easy to drop out on our resolution when we get to the book of Leviticus. We don't spend a lot of time in the book of Leviticus in our preaching, do we? But I've been asking myself, myself the question, why is the book of Leviticus here? If we believe that all Scripture is inspired from God and is profitable for teaching and for instruction in righteousness, why do we have the book of Leviticus? What can we glean from Leviticus today? So that's the series that we're going to spend, I think, the next five weeks on. What is the book of Leviticus about? Uh, how does it apply to you and to me, and what keeps us going through the book of Leviticus. So, as we start, let me set the scene for you here just a little bit. In the book of Exodus, towards the end, God gives the Israelites instructions on to build a tabernacle. The Israelites are now traveling from spot to spot, uh, and, and, and God gives His people kind of a forerunner or precursor to the temple that they will eventually build by giving them instructions for a structure that He calls the tabernacle. 
Now this tabernacle is a temporary structure. It could be moved around as the Israelites moved from place to place. It was designed to be set up and taken down. In fact, here is a, a picture, a, a rendering, if you will, of what the tabernacle might have looked like. God gave very specific instructions for the tabernacle. So we know the sizes of things. We know kind of how it was laid out. You can see there's kind of this curtain or this tent all the way uh, around the, the outside of the tabernacle there. You can see that there's an altar there in the middle. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about the altar next week and the week after that. That's where the sacrifices were made. You can see there were some tables around the outside for the slaughter of the animals. There was a, a place there where you could the priests would wash their hands, and then there would be a temple in there. And let me just talk about the sizes of these things for just a moment to help you try to picture this tabernacle that we're going to be referencing throughout our time in Leviticus. That fence, that curtain that's kind of around the outside, uh, God told them to make that 150 feet long and 75 feet wide. Okay, now if you've ever been in the PBC auditorium, I measured this out. I'll try to give you just a rough visualization of what it looks like. From where the stage starts, to the back wall is about 60 feet. Okay, and the tabernacle was 100, or the, the, the fence was 150 feet. So two lengths of the auditorium plus a half would be about 150 feet. God told them to build it 75 feet wide. The auditorium is roughly 50 feet across. So just a little bit wider, about two and a half times the size of our auditorium. But the actual tabernacle, the place where only the priests would enter into, it was 45 feet by 15 feet. 45 feet long, 15 feet wide. That's about the first couple of rows in the auditorium there. Inside the tabernacle, there was one room, the holy place. It was 30 feet long by 15 feet wide. And then behind that was what they called the most holy place, or the holy of holies, and it was the last 15 feet of that structure, 15 by 15. There was a veil that was, that was like blue and purple and scarlet that, that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. Uh, this, this veil, this curtain, if you will, had designs of cherubim or angels uh, embroidered on it, and it was hung uh, by gold rings uh, between these two places, the holy place and the holy of holies. And Scripture tells us that there was either a cloud by day or a pillar of fire by night that would rest directly over the mercy seat that was in the Holy of Holies. This cloud or pillar of fire would rest directly over the Holy of Holies. That was the symbol of the presence of God. And when it moved, or when God moved, then the Israelites would know that it was time to move. Now, the purpose of the tabernacle here was, was so that God might dwell among His people, among the Israelites. Here's what we read in Exodus chapter 29, verse 46, And they will know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, so that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. The tabernacle was very detailed work. God gave very specific instructions on how to build it. And in the conclusion of the book of Exodus, we see Moses doing everything that God commanded him to do. And when Moses was done building the tabernacle, the Spirit of God settled on the tabernacle. Here's that scene. This is the end of the book of Exodus. Chapter 40, the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was unable to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud rested on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The Israelites set out whenever the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle throughout all the stages of their journey. If the cloud was not taken up, they did not set out until the day it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and there was a fire inside the cloud by night, visible to the entire house of Israel throughout all the stages of their journey. So that's how the book of Exodus ends. The tabernacle has been built. The Spirit of God is there, symbolized by the cloud or the pillar of fire. But did you notice how that verse ends? It says, Moses was unable to enter the tent of meeting. In fact, look at how Leviticus chapter 1, verse 1 starts. Here's how Leviticus reads at the very beginning. Then the Lord summoned Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. 
Do you see it there? You catch it? He spoke to him from the tent. Why from? Why from the tent? Why not bring Moses into the tent? I mean, Moses is still on the outside. Why? But to understand the book of Leviticus, to see the significance of this book and why I think it's here, we have to understand this verse. We have to understand verse 1. And to understand verse 1, we have to understand and grasp God's holiness. Or let me say this another way, and if you print it off an outline from online, this is where you can begin taking notes. To understand Leviticus, we have to understand God's holiness. Let me talk about this idea of holiness for just a moment, really for the remainder of our time together. You know, we use this term for God, holy, all the time, don't we? Uh, I don't know about you, the first thing that came to mind when I was thinking about this are the songs that we sing. Just think about all of the songs that we sing in church that describe God as holy. Right? I mean, there's the traditional hymn, maybe you've heard it, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Have you heard that song? Of course, we just got done singing a Christmas song, Oh, Holy Night. And then there are several other songs that came up in my searching for this. Of all the time we use the word holy, there's the song called Agnes Day. It goes, Alleluia, Alleluia, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Alleluia, holy, holy, are you Lord God Almighty. There's the song called Holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Or how about this one, the Revelation song, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. Or there's another one that we've sung recently, You are holy. It goes, You are holy, you are mighty, you are worthy, worthy of praise. And there were a dozen others, at least, of just ones that we sing on a regular basis at PBC that describe God is holy. We use that term in our songs all the time. We see holy used to describe God not only in our songs, but in Scripture. Right here's just a few occasions. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, And one called to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. His glory fills the whole earth. Psalm chapter 99, verse 9, Exalt the Lord our God, bow in worship at His holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. Revelation chapter 4, each of the four living creatures had six wings. They were covered with eyes around and inside. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, 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 Lord God, the Almighty, who was and is and who is to come. People in Scripture use the word holy. Angels use the word holy to describe God. But not only that, God uses the word holy to describe Himself. And He calls us to holiness at the same time. Leviticus chapter 11, verses 44 and 45, For I am the Lord your God, so you must consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. Do not defile yourselves by any swarming creature that crawls on the ground, for I am the Lord who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God. So you must be holy because I am holy. Chapter 19, speak to the entire Israelite community and tell them, Be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. A few chapters later, it says, You are to consider Him holy since He presents the food of your God. He will be holy to you because I, the Lord who sets you apart, am holy. Time and time again, God describes Himself as holy. He says, I am holy. And did you notice in those last three verses we read, what's the common theme? They all show up in the book of Leviticus. This idea of God being holy is a recurring theme in this book. So what is holiness? What are we talking about? Now, we might often think of holiness as being a good person, right? Trying to do the right thing. Uh, You're trying to be morally good. You look at that person, they're being all holy and everything, right? Like we just think they're trying to be a good person. And so uh, because of that, I think we often think of God's holiness as just being morally perfect. God is just just better, right? And while that is true, God's holiness is a lot more than that. To be holy is to be separate, 
It's this idea of, of cutting off and setting aside or cutting off and, and setting apart. To be holy is to be unique. One commentator put it this way, that the definition of holy is this, separated from sin and devoted to seeking his own honor. And separated from sin isn't like how you and I try to separate ourselves from sin, like it's still there, but we're trying to, to, to squash it down and do just a little bit better. No, no, God is separated, cut off, apart from sin. To say that God is holy is to say that God is not like you and me. God is not just a little bit better than you and me when it comes to the holiness scale, if you will. God is totally separate from us. I think we've watered down the idea of holiness, even just in our everyday language. Maybe you've heard somebody describe something as holy, like as an adjective or something. Remember the old TV show, Batman and Robin, that was on TV, and, and Robin, would he had that little catchphrase where about once an episode he would say something to Batman like, holy sardines, or holy Toledo, Batman. Uh, you can Google it. He, he used that an awful lot. Holy guacamole, that was another one. That he said, and he's just using it flippantly, but in the process, we're watering down the idea of what holiness means. God's holiness is so pure, it is so unique, God is so set apart that we can't even interact with His holiness. Moses tried to interact with the holiness of God early on in the book of Exodus. Do you remember the story of the burning bush? When that bush is on fire, but it's not actually getting burned up. And Moses says, I need to go take a closer look at that. And as he's approaching this fire, approaching the holiness of God, here's what happens. Uh, here's what it reads in Exodus chapter 3, verse 4. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, he answered. Do not come closer, he said. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he continued, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. You know, and God is so holy that later on in the book of Exodus, chapter 33, interestingly enough, Moses asked to get a glimpse of God's face. He says, can I see a glimpse of your glory? Pastor Andy referenced a story a sermon or two ago, so we're not going to read it again here. But you know how God responded? You remember what he said? He said, no one can see my face and live. Why? It's because God's holiness is dangerous. And the closer we get to God's holiness, the more dangerous it is for you and for me and for the nation of Israel. Why? Is it because God's holiness is bad? Actually, it's quite the opposite. It's because He is so good. It's because He is so pure. It is dangerous for us in our impurity. It's not a perfect example by any means, but the thing that came to mind as I was thinking about this was like an MRI. Right? Have you ever had an MRI done? You know what those letters stand for? Magnetic Resonance Imaging. I've had one MRI done, and when I was getting it done, they asked me the same question multiple times. Different people asked it. Each person asked it a lot of times, almost to the point of frustration for me, like, no, no, you know, stop asking me that question. And I know they're just trying to be extra cautious because you know what the question was? And if you've had one done, maybe your experience was the same. But they asked me over and over and over again, do you have any metal on you? Right? They wanted to me, were my pants pockets empty? Did I still have my, my belt on? Was I wearing my watch or my ring or my glasses? Uh, or did I have like a rod at some point inserted into my leg or, or some screws into my arm or something like that? They wanted to make sure that I wasn't going to go into that giant magnet with some piece of metal or, to phrase it another way, with some sort of impurity. And it, it's not a perfect example, again, but it, if I had gone into that MRI machine, this giant magnet with this impurity of metal in me, eh, that was not going to end well for me. And God is, is so good and so unique 
and so set apart that His holiness is one of His defining characteristics. Like what we read in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, when the angels call out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. His glory fills the whole earth. This word holy is how we describe who God is. It's how the angels describe the nature of God. And again, it's not a perfect example, but I thought of when I read this verse, the sun. Right, the sun fills the earth with, with its light, but the closer we get to the sun and that intensity of heat and light is dangerous for us. In the same way, when we get closer to God and His holiness, when we are in a state of impurity, that's dangerous for us. And we read time and time again in the Bible, any interaction that someone had with the holiness of God leaves them traumatized. It leaves them different, face down, trembling, even at times dead. We're going to cover that in a few weeks in Leviticus. When people approached God in a state of impurity and they had an encounter with God's holiness and it left them dead. So, we have this tabernacle. And it's in the middle of this outside curtain, this outside fence. And as we move closer to the tabernacle and begin to work our way back towards the Holy of Holies, where God is, there were things that needed to be done. Things that needed to be done in a certain order, very specific direction. Steps that needed to be taken the closer one got to God's presence and His holiness. And the book of Leviticus is about those steps that needed to happen. Without those steps, that takes us back to Leviticus chapter 1, verse 1. When Moses was spoken to by God from the tent, Moses couldn't come any closer because of God's holiness and because of Moses' impurity. And to interact with those two things, Moses' impurity and God's holiness, that would have been very dangerous for him. It is because of God's holiness that God is also just. God demands a payment for this sin, for this impurity that we've been talking about. And He said to the nation of Israel, He said, If I'm going to dwell among you, and you're going to be in my presence, you have to atone for your sins. And that's what we're going to read about in the book of Leviticus. God lays out several different types of sacrifices using animals and, and food and, and offerings and things like that that would satisfy His requirement for atonement. We're going to look at those and, and study them a little bit deeper over the next several weeks. And when we get to the end of the book of Leviticus, the next book, if you've stuck on your resolution and you're continuing to read, is Numbers. And here's how it reads in Numbers chapter 1, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses in the tent of the meeting. See it there? Where did he speak to him from? In the tent. What happened in the book of Leviticus worked. Right? The plan that God lays out in the chapters of Leviticus does what it is supposed to do. So where does this leave us? I mean, how does Leviticus apply then to you and to me? Why, why should we keep reading this book? How, how does this book, filled with sacrifices and laws and offerings and sins, how does it apply to you and me? And we don't offer sacrifices anymore, do we? Right? I mean, have, have we been getting it wrong? Are we doing this wrong? Over the course of this series, I hope we lay out this idea that like the Israelites, we will all come face to face with God and His holiness. We will have an encounter with the holiness of God. And to understand God's holiness is to understand that He is not like you and me. God, who is set apart from sin, separated from sin, devoted to His own glory, unique, perfectly good, of whom there is like no other, of, who, of whom the angels still cry out night and day we read, holy, holy, holy. An interaction with God and His holiness is to experience something on a magnitude that we can't even begin to comprehend. God is holy. That's what the book of Leviticus teaches us. But Leviticus also teaches us that God is also love. God is also mercy. And he wanted to provide a way for the Israelites to have a relationship with him while satisfying God being just. 
And he also wanted to provide a way for you and for me to have a relationship with God. And remember what Pastor Andy said last week, God is not obligated to do any of this. He wasn't obligated to do it for the nation of Israel. He wasn't obligated to do it for us, but he did it anyway. And what Leviticus points us to is that the reason we don't make habitual sacrifices anymore is because Jesus Christ made the ultimate sacrifice, paying the price for your sin and mine. We keep going through the book of Leviticus because it teaches us about God's holiness. We keep going through the book of Leviticus because it ultimately points to the total, complete, and permanent sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. And we keep going through the book of Leviticus because we learn that God isn't like you and me and that we must approach Him on His terms, not our own. So, here's what you can do. Let me leave you a couple things to just meditate on and be thinking about this week as we continue to unpack Leviticus next week and really begin to dig in. Recognize that the holiness of God is very dangerous for you and for me. Not because it's bad, not because it makes God bad, but the opposite, because His holiness is so good, so pure, and you and I are filled with sin and with impurity, and we can't approach God in our impure state. Understand that God does not change. The same God that we read about in Leviticus is the same God today, and God is still holy. The angels still cry out, holy, holy, holy. And everyone needs to know that there will come a day when we will all stand in the presence of a holy God and come face to face with Him and His holiness one day. And on one hand, we can either be thankful that we've accepted that free gift of salvation and, and because God is who He is and He did what He said He would do, that God will allow us to spend eternity in His presence, to spend eternity in the presence of His holiness because of the atoning work of Jesus Christ that makes us pure, that makes us holy in the sight of God. Or On the other hand, if you haven't accepted Jesus' free gift of salvation, if you haven't accepted Jesus' free gift of this atoning work, then you will spend eternity away from the blessing presence of God because of this holiness that Leviticus teaches us about. God is holy. Meditate on that this week. If there's questions that we've raised or you just need to talk to somebody about the things that you've heard, feel free to reach out to us. We'd love to have the opportunity to talk with you further. Thanks for being part of PBC Online today. I pray that something from this service will stick with you over the next several days. Don't forget about our offer to pray for you. You can contact us, office at panamabaptist.org and let us know what we can be praying about and we can get that routed to the appropriate team, whether it's the weekly prayer update or carrier battle group or both. Friends, we'll see you next time. In the meantime, go with God, stay with God. We'll see you next time.